Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 22. For three years, Aram and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah came down to the king of Israel. The king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? Yet we are doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. He said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of them, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? They said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom we may inquire? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one other by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Jehoshaphat said, let the king not say such a thing. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and king Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Chenana, made for himself horns of iron, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying the same and saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hands of the king. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the words of the prophets are with one accord and are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. When he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go up to battle at Ramoth Gilead or shall we refrain? He answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah said, I saw Israel all scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy anything favorable about me, but only disaster? Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing beside him to the right and to the left of him. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Then one said one thing and another said until a certain spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. How? The Lord asked him. He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Then the Lord said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Oh, man. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I'm not kidding. There is just so much drama in it. Our current sermon series is entitled Hidden Figures, and we're exploring stories of obscure characters in the Bible who don't get the spotlight very often in the life of the church. And so today's focus is on a man by the name of Micaiah who's referenced in only two short moments in these books of history in the Bible. Now, honestly, though, we could have done a hidden figure sermon on almost any of the minor prophets in the Bible who have books named after them. These are people like Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Even though their names are on the table of contents in the Bible, I am sure that none of us have them memorized, let alone know very much about these prophets. 
But the Bible is even full of so many other prophets who don't have the honor of having a book named after them. Prophets of both genders, actually. Moses' sister Miriam, for example, is called a prophet, and it says that the Lord speaks through her. The judge Deborah receives the designation in the Old Testament of being a prophet, as do other women such as Huldah and Noadia. And then in the New Testament, we're told that there's a man named Philip, and he has four daughters who all prophesy. So from the very beginning, being a prophet was not just a man's game, but regardless of the gender of the prophet, so many of them have been relegated to obscurity. So to help us remember some of these prophets, I thought we might compare them to famous TV shows. The prophet Isaiah, for example, might be Doctor Who, because just as different actors have played Doctor Who throughout history, and it's still the same TV show, the book of Isaiah was actually written over hundreds of years by different authors, and it's still the same book. Or maybe it's Law and Order or Grey's Anatomy, because at 66 chapters, the book just goes on and on and never ends. Ezekiel tells the story of a graveyard where bones come back to life, so that one is definitely The Walking Dead. Hosea has some super racy elements, so we're talking Game of Thrones or Euphoria. Amos is all about social justice, and so it's like watching a really powerful documentary like Ava DuVernay's 13th or An Inconvenient Truth. Haggai is like C-SPAN. You sound really smart if you say you watch it, but no one actually does. We could go on and on here. It doesn't matter what your favorite TV show might be. It could be MASH or Brady Bunch or Breaking Bad or Atlanta. There is a prophet for you. But Micaiah, well, Micaiah is all of the trashy reality TV that we know and love. Keeping up with the Kardashians, Real Housewives, The Bachelor, Micaiah is all about the drama. Now, before we dig into his story, I think it's always important when we're talking about the prophets to give a little caveat because there's often a misconception about the Hebrew prophets. We often think of prophets as people who tell the future, and there is an element of that in today's story. But the role of the prophets in ancient Israel had a much greater purpose. Prophets arrived on the scene in Israel at the very same time as the first king because they were part of a system of checks and balances in the nation. The prophets were intended to speak up, to speak truth to power to the kings, any time they veered off the path that God intended. And so that is the basis for the drama in today's scripture reading, is Micaiah being willing to share a hard truth, even though he knows the king will not want to hear it. The passage opens by telling us that King Jehoshaphat of Judah comes to the king of Israel. Now, if you remember your history of the Old Testament here, you might remember that after the famous King Solomon, King David's son, the nation of Israel splits into two. There is a coup, and then there is now a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah that continues to be ruled by David's descendants. Sometimes Israel and Judah were in conflict with each other. Other times they were individually engaged in war with other nations, and sometimes they would form an alliance with each other to go to war with a surrounding nation. The books of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, these all tell the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. And in 1 Kings 22, there has been three years of peace between Israel and Aram, a region in modern-day Syria. In the third year of that peace, the king of Jehoshaphat goes to visit the king of Israel, and the king of Israel has been getting itchy. In verse 3, he's talking out loud to his people, his entourage, his posse. He's getting worked up. He's probably pacing around. We're just sitting here, he yells, doing nothing. We're being in peace. Blah. Ramoth Gilead used to belong to us, and we need to go and grab it back. It's hard for people in power not to want more power, more land, more money, even if it means going from a state of peace to a state of war. And so the king of Israel turns to Jehoshaphat, who's just chilling on his vacation to the north, and he says, hey man, you've got to come with me. 
Jehoshaphat reassures the king of Israel, you're my ride or die, man. Me horses as Sioux horses. Let's do this. <laughs> Three years of peace are about to come to an end because one man isn't satisfied with the amount of power that he has. When you read through the historical books, you find that by and large, the kings of Judah are a lot more devoted to God than the kings of Israel. The Bible even tells us that Jehoshaphat, even though he's about to commit a major blunder here, usually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So before he enters into battle, he wants to consult with the prophet of Yahweh to see if he can hear a word from God. The king of Israel replies that that's no problem at all. He's got 400 bros over here. Uh, you might call them sycophants. You might call them yes men. That doesn't matter. That's just semantics. The king calls them his prophets. And they will tell him whatever he wants to hear. He gathers them around and he enthusiastically asks them, should we go and take Ramoth Gilead? Yes or super yes? And the prophets all reply in unison, oh, super duper yes. And then it gets even weirder here. It's like they're hanging out at a drunken frat party because one of them even puts on horns made of iron and he starts running around destroying stuff and he proclaims, you're going to gore the Arameans, man, just like this. It's weird. It seems like this king is ruling like he has a magic eight ball. Should I go to Ramoth Gilead? My sources say no. Ask again later. Signs point to yes. All right, let's go. The king always gets the answer he wants. But Jehoshaphat isn't quite satisfied. He informs the king of Israel, you know that none of these guys actually speaks on behalf of the Lord, right? The king of Israel wants to consult with his people, but Jehoshaphat wants to hear from someone who's connected to Yahweh. And so the king of Israel lets out a big petulant groan. Oh, yes, there is one guy who we can ask who says he gets a word from the Lord, but I hate this guy. He's terrible. He never says anything nice about me. He always says I'm wrong. We can't talk to him. Yet Jehoshaphat insists, and so Micaiah is summoned. The messenger who goes to get Micaiah warns him, look, 400 other people have already told the king exactly what he wants to hear, and so you better say the same thing. Micaiah insists, though, I only speak the truth. Whatever God says, says to me, that's what I will say. When Micaiah arrives to the palace, the king of Israel is skeptical. He sees Micaiah and flatly states, look, I know what you're going to say, so just say it. Should I go to Ramoth Gilead or not? Micaiah's response, though, shocks him. Just like the 400 other so-called prophets, Micaiah says, go ahead. The Lord will give it into your hands. I have no idea why Micaiah said that at first. Maybe he just wanted to poke fun at the king, pretending to say what he knew he wanted him to say. Or perhaps he got nervous about delivering a hard truth. I have to say that I totally get that. I preach all the time about speaking up when someone says something offensive, but then there are moments where I hear someone say something ridiculously awful and I'm shocked into silence thinking, oh my God, did they just say that? Should I say something? So I get that speaking up can be difficult sometimes. But the king of Israel can't believe that Micaiah would actually say something agreeable. Stop that, he retorts. Tell me what God actually said. Okay, yeah, Micaiah admits, you're screwed. Uh, if you do this, you're going to die, and people, you are going to be scattered like sheep without a shepherd. No, the, scream, the king screams in reply, I knew you would say something bad. Get out of here. It's just this hilarious scene, right? You're going to be all right. Tell me the truth. You're going to die. Get out of here. The king can't accept anyone contradicting him. But before he goes, Micaiah informs the king that the Lord already told him that God would orchestrate the king's downfall by sending a bunch of people who would lie to him and tell him only what he wanted to hear. The rest of the chapter is so much drama. If you want to read more on your own, Micaiah is thrown into prison for telling the truth. Sure enough, the king of Israel is killed in battle with Aram, and dogs come to eat his carcass. It's a nasty scene. Less Kardashians, more Sopranos in the end. But I am amazed at Micaiah's ability here to tell the king of Israel 
who, although he's not named in this passage, is the infamous King Ahab, that starting this war is wrong and the results are going to be disastrous, even if 400 people are saying the opposite. And although, as I said, prophets are not meant solely to predict the future, there is something prescient about this story as it relates to our times. Because the passage gives the perfect example of an echo chamber thousands of years before the term will be invented. Ahab spends time only with people who will tell him exactly what he wants and who already believe what he believes. And when someone like Micaiah is brave enough to say the opposite, Ahab wants to block him from his social media channels as soon as possible. I'm going to let you in on a little secret about being a pastor. When I was ordained 12 years ago, I was not given a direct line to God so that I could speak exactly what God says. No one let me know God's personal cell phone number so I could send a quick text if I had any questions. I didn't receive a manual that said what the Bible really means so that I could tell you all the one right interpretation of Scripture. And at no point when I'm preaching does the Spirit of God take over and my words become God's words. I do my very best to study scripture and the history of my faith and to understand it and share my views of the Bible and spirituality and Christianity. But in the end, that's all they are. They're my views, my human, potentially flawed views. It's always incumbent upon the rest of us to be able to take what we hear, to think for ourselves, and to determine how best we can take the message we hear on Sunday and use it to live it out in the real world, to love God and love our neighbors better. Instead, in American Christianity, we have created echo chambers where we will surround ourselves with people who will tell us exactly what we want to hear and exactly what we already believe, and we will pass it off as God's absolute truth and won't ever say anything that will challenge us or help us become better people who expand our understanding of ourselves and of God. It is scary to me how many churches behave as if they have cornered the market on truth and you have to agree with everything that they say or be labeled an apostate. And the result is that you get 400 people sitting together on a Sunday all saying the same thing. And the result is as disastrous as King Ahab's plans for war. American Christianity has been co-opted by the quest for power. It is so intertwined now as a tool of our political system that it's starting to seem impossible to ever unravel it. Our faith is no longer about caring for orphans and refugees and feeding the hungry and ending war. All that stuff Jesus says is just blah, 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 not important. Our faith is supposed to be about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. But American Christianity does its best to comfort the comfortable and ignore the afflicted. We need people as brave as Micaiah to declare that we can do so much better as Christians than we are doing in this country. But that's not the message people want to hear. Thankfully, our faith is so much bigger than just the United States In the two Sundays leading up to the election, we're going to do a two-part sermon series on how our faith matters and shapes our lives regardless of the results on election night. But here's a little preview for you. God cannot be contained by any two-party political system. God cannot be held captive within the borders of this nation. God cannot be spoken for by a certain culture or race or gender or politics. God is not a member of any specific church or denomination or man-made religion. God has not co-signed anyone's version of the truth. The celebration of World Communion Sunday each year is a reminder to us that we worship a God who is alive and moving across the borders and boundaries and ethnicities and languages of this world. When we come to the communion table, we do so with people all over the world who do not think like us, who do not believe like us, who do not speak like us, who do not worship like us or sing like us or vote like us, who are not like us much at all. And yet somehow God encompasses all of us. 
God's love is for all of us. I believe that American Christianity is not at the end of its spiritual journey. We are not at the end of our own personal spiritual journeys. We have so much left to learn. And so my prayer on this World Communion Sunday is that we do not get stuck in echo chambers, but instead let us listen for a God who each day is guiding us into a deeper and more compassionate faith. Amen?